amazing to be here. I was last here in Bangalore 23 years ago where I actually met the mother of my autistic son who was born um, seven years to the day that we met and to the hour that we spoke here in Bangalore. So it's very interesting for me to be back here full circle talking about autism. That life that she was referring to was a life that I had before autism. Then autism came along and went and I went, ah! And then I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And like a lot of special needs parents, um, you know, we're talking about another kind of blindness. Uh, you don't have um, any information. You don't know what to do. I had been brought up um, partly in a school um, that had been one of the first real inclusion schools in the UK. And I remembered that um, the very few autistic kids that we had there, because autism was not the pandemic then that it is now, and there are reasons why it's a pandemic now, but we don't need to go into those. Um, I remembered that these kids had a special brilliance. This had stayed in my mind, that they were all really kind of awesomely intelligent on a meta level, even if you couldn't quite connect with them as a neurotypical person. So I thought, okay, I'm a journalist. What do journalists do? Journalists ask questions. So I need to ask the question, what to do? Who do I ask the question of? I can't ask the question of somebody not autistic because they won't be able to tell me anything about autism. They can give me ideas, but they won't give me, and opinions, but they won't give me actual experience. So I thought, well, who is the person who started life non-verbal, shitting his pants, rocking in a corner like my son, who sort of made it in the neurotypical world? And in, that was an easy person to find. That was Dr. Temple Grandin, who's probably America's best known autistic person, and she's now a professor of animal sciences at uh, Colorado State University, multiple best-selling author, etc. But she was nonverbal, incontinent, and so forth when she was very young. So I went to her and I had an interview with her and I said, how does my son become you? And she said, actually, Rupert, it's very simple. Do three things. She said, follow your child. She said, actually, physically follow him. Because if he's nonverbal, he can't say, Dad, I want to go check out the white chair. He's going to go to the white chair and check it out. So if you're saying, no, sit over here like a good little boy, then you're going to miss the opportunity to see what he's interested in. The second thing he, she said was, follow him emotionally. And what you'll find is that what makes him happy and what makes him unhappy usually comes down to sensory issues. For example, these bright lights that are shining in my face, I hate them, I can't look at them. They're really upsetting for me. And this slight echo where I can hear my voice coming back to myself makes me want to walk off the stage. I can fake it, and I can be here for a short period of time. But if I, as a neurotypical person, am suffering from those sorts of sensory issues. As an autistic person with an overstimulated nervous system born that way, you can imagine how overwhelming these things are. And she said, you'll notice very quickly that the things that upset him are generally man-made, like this echo, like those lights, and the things that put him at peace will be generally nature. So try to do your stuff outside in nature, because there aren't bad sensory triggers out there. If there's extreme heat, you can get into shade. If there's extreme cold, you can put a coat on or make a fire. But apart from that, you're usually OK. And then she said that finally, um, follow him intellectually. So she said, even if he's not verbal and he's just stimming, like let's say he's just banging this, you can get irritated and you can say, stop banging this. Or you can observe how he's banging it. And he said, if he's banging it in a way that's very rhythmic and repetitive, you're probably dealing with a math science brain. And if he's stimming kind of like this, you're probably dealing with an art storytelling brain, more exploratory. So there's a lot of clues here that you don't want to lose. I said, this makes perfect sense. So I went home, and the behavioral therapists that were working with my kid were doing the opposite. And they were making him sit in rooms and do these repetitive tasks, and he hated it, and he was crying and throwing himself at the door, and self-harming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I said, well, look, I just went to talk to the world's most famous autistic person. And she said, to do the opposite of what you're doing. And immediately, these therapists got very aggressive with me. And I thought, OK, well, why? Why are you getting aggressive with me? Um, why do humans, why do monkeys get aggressive? Monkeys get aggressive when they're afraid of something. 
So what could you be afraid of? And it's like, well, the only thing I could logically think of that you could be afraid of is that maybe you um, know deep down that your shtick doesn't really work and you are feeling a bit guilty that you're charging me $100 an hour for this. And, um, you know, like all people, when they feel guilty, they behave badly. So, okay, I understand this. I'm going to do what Temple Grandin said. And I did. And I went outside because he wanted to go outside, literally outside the back door where we have woods. And immediately he wanted to put things in his mouth. And I could say yes or I could say no, but I wanted to foster communication, so I didn't want to be saying no. Fortunately, in my previous life, I had lived with hunting and gathering tribes in Africa for quite long periods of time, and actually even here in India a little bit with the, Mun um, the Munuvan tribe and a little bit with the Todas um, in the Nilgiri Hills, who are not hunter-gatherers, but nonetheless. And so I knew from this that um, about 60 to 70% of what you see around you, generally you can eat. So I got a guidebook and I got online and um, we started to forage together for wild foods. And immediately we had communication and we had science and we had all, all sorts of amazing stuff, even if we had no language. And we had movement and we were doing it in nature. Then he saw my neighbor's horse and he went straight to her. And he couldn't tell me he wanted to get up, but he could do this next to her. I knew the horse, I am a professional horseman, I knew the horse was quiet, I knew the horse was safe, so I put him up, and I just kept my hand on him like this, while the horse grazed. And all of his most agitated stuff just went away. And I thought, that's interesting. So then I started riding with him, and I put him in the saddle in front of me, and I'm riding down towards a pond, and a big blue heron, a big blue water bird, gets up and flies away, and he said, heron. And I said, fuck me. He's talking. And I noticed very quickly that he spoke when the horse was in certain ways of moving. So I then began to live in the saddle with my son for literally three to four hours a day. And I began to paint letters on trees and put them together in, as Lion King characters with a little Lion King character at the end of the fifth tree. You know, and he would totally learn to read. And then I would get friends and family to line up and make one wear a silly hat. And we would take that one away with the horse's nose, bumping it, doing silly fart noises or something. And he totally learned to add, subtract, multiply, divide, blah, 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 this way. By now, I was homeschooling him because I was living in Texas at that time. Um, and in my local schools in Texas, they teach you about that basically Jesus invented the AR-16 assault rifle. And they don't have a lot of good options for autism. So I started to homeschool, and I realized that I could um, basically teach the national curriculum kinesthetically this way. By now he's talking and so on. And then we did something a bit nuts. We rode across Mongolia together. And we rode from shaman to shaman, and we made a film about it. And the reason I know about that side of life is through all my work with indigenous peoples. But I had to bring a group of uh, Bushmen hunter-gatherers that I was doing a land claim for to the United Nations and the US State Department in the year he was diagnosed. And some of them were healers in their culture and did some work on Rowan, which is really prayer, and um, got really quite an extraordinary result. So I just wanted to go to a place that combined those two things. But more than that, I wanted to really make the point to myself, to my family, that autism is not some sort of catastrophe, that autism is um, this total adventure. It's a real adventure. I was adventuring on horseback. I was going across Mongolia. I was doing this. I was adventuring intellectually and in the worlds of the spirit. And I had been brought into these extraordinary places through autism. OK. Now, horses, what you can see happening behind me with this little kid here, it's a lot of fun to do this stuff, is um, one thing. But horses will always be a niche. But let me tell you why it works and then how it relates to you sitting in this room. Because we don't just work with horses. We've now we figured out how to do what we do without ever using a horse. But there are some differences, a couple of key differences in the autistic brain. Little ones, but ones that are worth thinking about. There is often an overdeveloped amygdala. The amygdala is the part of your brain that governs fight, flight, and freeze. And it's a useful thing. It keeps you alive. But the problem is it produces um, something called cortisol. And cortisol is a neurotoxin that kills brain cells. And it's designed to stop you from thinking in a split second so you act. 
So if an elephant comes through the wall behind me right now and plows through the room, you don't listen to the boring old hippie standing on stage. You dive to the side and you only resume listening to boring old hippie when the elephant has gone through the other wall. That's your amygdala at work. The problem is, is if it's overactive and it's being overstimulated all the time by bad sensory triggers and not very nice people, etc., etc., then you're just going to produce cortisol, 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 cortisol. You can't think, you can't learn. Okay. When you ride a horse like this, you rock your hips in rhythm. Anything that makes you rock your hips in rhythm feels good. You can think of a few activities. Um, the person be before me was speaking of some activities that make us feel good, which involve rocking. They're, they're also dangerous. She's got a baby up there. You can, you know, um, they can be expensive, but hey. Um, why does it make you feel good? Because when you rock your hips in rhythm, you produce a hormone. And that hormone is called oxytocin. And oxytocin isn't just the feel-good hormone, it's the communication hormone. Because when you do have a baby together, you face an awful lot of decades where it's not quite as much fun as it was making that baby. And you need to have a motivation to, stay, to communicate with each other as a partner, because if one partner leaves, particularly in the wild context of humanity, then the chances of survival for the kid go down. So we have produced this thing in our body, and all mammals have it, called the mammalian caregiving system. When we relax our psoas muscle that goes through here and rock the hips, all of our organs start to produce oxytocin. So the kids will begin to talk, but so will you. And then some other things happen. Anytime you move and problem solve, like we're doing there with the... Uh, the boy killing his mummy with the sword, your brain produces a protein called BDNF in English. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Basically, the brain producing more of its own brain cells. So imagine if using your computer, it just started to like reproduce its hard drive and reproduce its hard drive and get better and better and amazing, amazing. But then when you shut it down and put it to sleep and you went back to it, it wasn't maybe working quite as well as before. So you can see that there's a connection here between, say, um, dementia as well. If you put old people in old people parking, their brains die. And if you put babies in baby parking, and they're just looking at screens all the time, their brains don't really develop. They need to be moving, they need to be problem solving. So you get this effect as well, the BDNF, which makes the intellect come alive. And then, in this part of your brain here, your cerebellum, your little brain, you have some cells with a funny name called Purkinje cells, who are named after a Czech guy in the 19th century who was like the Leonardo da Vinci of Eastern Europe, who discovered kind of everything, it seems, uh, if you Google him. Um, these are big neurons, and these neurons um, connect all the different parts of your brain and make them work together. People with autism sometimes lack Purkinje cells. It's been found from some autopsies. So that can explain why perhaps you might get a person with high-functioning autism who is a math professor but has terrible social skills or let's say with slightly lower functioning autism who can remember all the football scores for 25 years but can't wipe his ass. It's because the different parts of the brain aren't communicating properly. So if you do these types of activities, you're going to get the oxytocin going, you're going to promote BDNF, and you're going to promote the production of Purkinje cells. Well, guess what? It also works if you're not autistic. So what happened was we were doing this and doing this with my son and doing the national curriculum and having these kind of spectacular successes. And then we got curious, did it work for others? So we started opening it up to other kids and other kids started coming and sure enough it worked. But it worked for their neurotypical siblings as well. So now we have two ways of working. We have something called horse boy method, which will always be a niche thing that you saw those nice videos of. But you're sitting in an apartment in Bangalore, you're not gonna ride horses, we know this. But this is how we discovered the thing. And then we have something called movement method, which I encourage you to look at. And movement method is now in 20 countries. It's in school districts in Germany, in the USA, in England, for quote unquote normal kids. We're, we're going into the um, corporate world as well because people learn and work better this way. But it was autistic people who showed us how to do it. Not Rupert Isaacson saying, right, exactly. Not me, not me. I'm a moderately intelligent, depending on how much alcohol I've imbibed, um, 
neurotypical human being, but I don't have the same level of meta-intelligence as Dr. Temple Grand did, as my son and as some of those kids that I remembered from school growing up. And I, what I, where I have a talent is I will look for mentorship. I will look to be mentored by the people that have the experience on the ground who can show me what to do. And then what I can do is I can distill that information and communicate it. But it's not me, it's autistic people showing the world what to do yet again. Because they've actually been doing this for a long fucking time. The Einsteins, the Da Vinci's, the, the, the Newtons, all these people, pretty odd people in their communities, leading humanity always into these better places. Okay, so what happened to me was from what seemed to be, what was presented to me as a nightmare, I realized was a very beautiful dream. And these differently abled people, I feel when you are a enabled or normally abled person, but with lots of psychological world pain being carried around in your head, because just because you can move around and think in a neurotypical way does not mean that you're not messed up. I'm pretty messed up. I don't know about you. Who's messed up in this room? I'm pretty messed up. And the ones that don't put their hands up, you're just lying. <laughs> but that's all right, because we're messed up too, so it's fine. These, what I discovered, and this was the mentorship of these shamans and traditional healers from these communities in Africa, here in India, and other places that I work, really showed me, was that when you, the, the key to human happiness is service. This we know. You can't be happy unless you're in service. You can have a lot of money or you can have no money at all, and you'll be equally depressed if you're not in service. You can have relatively little money, you can have an awful lot of money, and you can be very fulfilled if you're putting that into service, but only if you are. This goes back to the idea of community and how human beings are actually supposed to live. We're all actually supposed to be at each other's service. Otherwise, we end up pretty messed up. So I think of these people that I work with as dream whisperers. They are shamans. And when you go into, by the way, the indigenous world, you notice pretty quickly that the people that are healers and shamans usually exhibit neuropsychiatric symptoms. Adult autism, schizophrenia, epilepsy, often all of the above, bipolar, etc., etc. And in those cultures, it's regarded as a job qualification. You already have one foot in the spirit world and you can help the idiots like me blundering about with real blindness, attitudinal blindness, to work it out. So, the important thing for everyone in this room, and I'm gonna quit in a minute, is what are your dreams? If these people are dream whisperers and we are in service, which we are, what are your dreams? What are they? And it doesn't have to be the dream of ending um, uh, climate change and pulling all the plastic out of the Pacific Ocean, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great dream. But I'm talking about really specific personal dreams that you had when you were six years old. Because we know what happens to dream. There's a dream. I'm life, right? Dream, life, this is life. Life comes along and goes <laughs> And then it goes like this. And that breaks our hearts, right? But the dream didn't go anywhere. The dream actually just underwent a planting and fertilization process. <laughs> and all it requires is moisture, usually blood, tears, sweat, and up it comes stronger than before. So the question is, what are your dreams? If you can't remember, if you push them away, don't worry. In an unguarded moment, 36 hours from asking yourself this question, you'll be sitting in traffic or sitting on the toilet, that's the other, you've got nothing else to do there, and it'll go bubble, bubble, ping, oh yes, that was it. And almost immediately you'll push it away, you go, I can't have it. But this time, because you're putting those dreams into service, the rules are different. You can have it, you will have it, you must have it, because that's the thing the fulfillment of those dreams that actually makes you get up every morning and do the same thing over and over again because it's not easy being a special needs parent. It's not easy doing this kind of work. There is burnout. This is what stops you burning out. That's the contract you make with God. That's the contract you make the, to, with the divine to put those dreams into service. And I look forward to coming back here in a year 
and finding out how some of those dreams are starting to come true. So what are your dreams? What's your dream? Yours. What are they? And that's all I've got. Thank you.